I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank the technical staff for making present us well. And I want to welcome the faculty, today's faculty. We have Srinivasada from US, we have Giovanni Storengi from Italy, and we have Steffen Schmitz Falkenberg uh, from Utah, US, but originally from Germany. However, we decided to present an Italian menu, which normally starts with antipasti going to be served by Giovanni Starenghi, followed by Primeri e Secondi delivered by Srinivasada, and finally we have a very nice dolce delivered by Steffen Schmitz Falkenberg. And if you eat, sorry, if, if you eat, and maybe don't eat the main before the antipasti has been served. I saw some people ate, had everything already, um, which might be a problem or not, we don't know. Anyway, enjoy, ask questions, be interactive, be interactive. Every question, there are no stupid questions and it's your opportunity to ask everything you wanna know from the experts. So let's start with the antipasti and Giovanni Starengi, welcome. Wait, because it probably will be terrible, so indigestible antipasti, so it's better to wait. You won't have, you won't have <laughs> spirits, no, no gin tonic after. Okay, so. okay, so I hope to be, be light. Light, exactly. Please. So I have a solution OCTs. Uh, these are my disclosure, and you know that we have a series of uh, OCTs from uh, starting from the stratus, that was, uh, you know, axial resolution of 10 microns and then going down, down, down until uh, the, the two new, I would say one ex uh, experimental from uh, MIT and the other from uh, Heidelberg, but it's uh, able to reach uh, up to three microns uh, axial resolution and 1.9. And we don't know for uh, the MIT one, but uh, 1.9 for the um, um, Heidelberg one. So what didn't change is transversal resolution, but it's still 14 microns. And uh, how they actually obtain, uh, thank you, such a results, just changing the fiber. So in, in, uh, in reality, there is no one laser, but there are three laser in the same fiber. And that technically, you can actually then uh, stop, uh, you know, to the either the booth and uh, uh, the engineers will explain a little bit better than me. But uh, having a, such a, a large uh, spectra, you can actually increase, uh, you know, the, the resolution. And these are just to compare with the uh, MIT uh, instrument. So these are the. Uh, published data from MIT, and you see uh, the results of uh, and the comparison between uh, an histology and, uh, you know, their uh, um, uh, instrument. And uh, just before uh, starting with sp uh, speaking about uh, the high resolution uh, OCT, you know, I, it's not the, re the instrument that you have. is actually, so you don't have to look at the acquisition that you know you can actually do from high speed to high resolution with the high resolution of CT, but it's a different uh, instrument. And so just to compare the spectral domain with the spectralis, the swept source, in this case was taken with the Plex Elite and the same subject with high resolution of CT. You see the much, much more details. And here, just to compare with the uh, Heidelberg, that you can now run at 20 kilohertz, 20, 125 or 85 kilohertz. The error resolution, it's uh, running at 85 kilohertz. And you see that, uh, you know, the, again, even if you have the same uh, speed, uh, and remember, if you reduce the speed, uh, you can actually get a better uh, quality. But still, you know, this is a, a big advantage having such a, a modification of the instrument. And particularly when you expand, you know, explode the image and you see the, the fovea here, that it's much more uh, defined and you can actually identify all the layers. And, uh, you know, from the old spectralis to the new high resolution. And of course, you can actually identify the choriocapillary better, 
the outer deep capillary plexus, the inner deep capillary plexus, you know, that, that spots that you see, it's our, our vessel. And if you look carefully, you can see the shape, the eight shape, you know, that is uh, usually, as you see, with the, with the, for, the, for identification of the vessels. And uh, of course, the OCTA that you can get from the choriocapillary to all the layers is much, much better and uh, better visualized. <laughs> the other thing that you probably remember that if you want to see the end fiber layer, you have to tilt the camera and you know, uh, just moving as outside the uh, center of the corner and you move up, the image is tilting and uh, tilting like that, you have uh, a, a, you know, more uh, reflectivity from the, from the end fiber layer. And you see here what, what you can actually see that it's not visible on this part, but it's visible in this part and the graph can show exactly what's happened. Now, because of that, they, you know, probably you read this paper uh, of uh, some years ago of, of directional OCT, where you actually move from one side to another and then you can actually visualize much better the end fiber layer. But here with a high resolution, you can actually, you don't need it. And you see that it's quite clear here, the end fiber layer that it's, uh, di you know, different from the outer nuclear layer that you see here. Of course, if you tilt and you do the same, you can increase the quality, you know, of the end fiber layer. But uh, again, you don't need if you want to see. The other interesting thing is that uh, look at the fovea. You can actually identify all the layers and, uh, you know, uh, working with my friend that uh, since many years, Ferdinando Bottoni was very interesting in uh, looking at uh, lamellar hole and a pseudo hole, find, to, to try to find the best way to differentiate. He was, uh, you know, so happy to see such a things, but this was the first patient that we collect. And uh, this was the second. So what we realize is that there is a huge variability in the foveal area. And uh, these are my uh, residents, actually most of them are here, and these are the, uh, you know, fovea. And you see that it's uh, very different than uh, our, everybody are, you know, perfect. No, no, no uh, lesion, nothing. But again, you see a, a very uh, variab high variability in uh, the foveal. Now, what, what we can actually also see is that if we look at the outer retina, we see much more uh, lines. And probably we are able now to differentiate the Brooks membrane from the RPE, and uh, that will be, uh, should be demonstrated. The other interesting thing is uh, how you see the vessels. And you see here the wall the cellularity of the, you know, the cells in the, in the blood and the fluid. And uh, particularly if you uh, compare, for example, with the, uh, you know, the adaptive optics, probably you see much better with the uh, eye resolution than not uh, with adaptive optics. And of course, uh, eye resolution can actually get a, an image wider than not uh, what you actually see with a small uh, field of view of the adaptive optics. And uh, by the way, you have one instrument that can do much more than not just acquiring another uh, instrument. So this is important. And for example, you can uh, be able to identify the two flow here, that uh, uh, the two branches of the vein, and you see that uh, you can actually identify at that point, the two flow. If I enlarge, you know, that if uh, they all the time, they uh, ratio, it's uh, stretching the retina. So if we do not stretch, we can actually see quite clearly the round vessels with the two flow inside. What about atrophy? You know that uh, the CAM initiative is trying to uh, study much better the, uh, the atrophy. And uh, of course, uh, the, the group identifying a series of uh, signs that you can actually uh, be able use useful to identifying early also early uh, phases of the uh, you know of geographic atrophy. And here just uh, examples. 
uh, between uh, what we actually be able to see uh, with the old device and with the new device. And you see that uh, particularly the basal laminar deposits are very well visible. Uh, here it's a very thick, but there are examples where you actually see very thin basal laminar deposits. And uh, as you know, probably you heard uh, uh, the presentation uh, at this meeting by Christine Curcio. It's uh, very important probably for the uh, development of uh, uh, AMD. And uh, again, the N-fiber layer that you see in that case, since there is a bumping, and so the fiber are better oriented from the, to the light, and you actually have more reflectivity there. Another example, uh, again, here it's a more subtle, and you see that uh, also here you can see the, you know, the uh, RPE and the Brooks membrane and uh, the deposition of basal laminar deposits in between. Of course, if you have uh, such an atrophy, you can actually see a very nice uh, image. But uh, again, if we compare with autofluorescence, it's clear that that is an area of atrophy. Here, uh, as a, a sign of OCTs, the hypertransmission area here. Uh, again, the basal laminar deposits here. But look at the vessels, and this is quite interesting. I show you before the, you know, the two flow in the retina, and here it's the same. And if you see the two vessels here correspond to the two flow in the same uh, choroidal vasculature. So it's, it's really incredible how you can actually see the details uh, in, uh, in, um, in using this uh, instrument. Another uh, you know, uh, image of uh, RP interruption or, you know, the same image of autofluorescence with the, a round-shaped atrophy, but you see the, the difference between uh, this one that has uh, the photoreceptor still present and uh, this one is that where, you know, the RP is gone, but also the photoreceptors are gone in the outer uh, retinal layer. Another example of uh, where we can actually identify all the uh, you know, uh, points that I try to underline in this uh, uh, presentation. And here it's an inflammatory MNVs, you see in uh, myopic eyes. And uh, after that, uh, and you see the hyper autofluorescent material that you always have at the edges of uh, an inflammatory uh, MNVs. The teleform material is very clear, the RP is uh, around, and you can differentiate, sorry, the drusen material from the vitelliform material quite clearly because of the reflectivity, it's uh, different. And uh, last but not least, when you have uh, a double layer sign, you can actually see you know, a lesion, like in this case, and this is the OCTA, or in this case, where you have a shallow irregular retinal pigment epithelium elevation without any uh, lesion. Here it's uh, a type three neovascularization. Again, the RPE that it's, uh, you know, interrupted, and uh, the type three there, and you see from another uh, point of view, you know, see the, the, the lesion there. The lamellar macula hole, and it's uh, quite interesting to see, uh, you know, all uh, the material over here uh, that is very well differentiated from the rest of the retina. So the, this proliferation that uh, allows us to understand before surgery exactly what you have to uh, face uh, with a melty uh, tissue. And here, the old OCTs and the new OCTs where you clearly see, you know, where this uh, proliferative material is, uh, uh, you know, um, located. So in conclusion, IRS OCT is a promising device. Of course, more detail could be better identified and probably all these will help us to better understand 
the disease and the follow up of uh, you know this, our patient. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni, for taking us on the journey what we are going to miss. Um, we are missing questions from the audience as well. Uh, are there any comments or thoughts uh, on high resolution, resolution OCT? Um, while you're thinking about your questions, I want to ask you, Giovanni, and, and the rest of the audience as well. I mean, the title is What Do We Miss? And we saw, for example, the, the additional bands uh, at the Brooks membrane level. So question number one is what do we expect from especially if have a better visualization of the Brooks membrane? What And in general, to everyone, where are the hopes what we can see better? Because huge fluid volumes, etc., they look up sharp, sharper like in... If you watch a football game on a high resolution TV, you don't want to go back to the lower resolution for aesthetic reasons because it just looks nicer. However, clinically, where are the expectations from your point of view? Well, I think uh, the most important is not actually the Brooks member, but probably you're not still able to measure the thickness. Mm -hmm. But uh, identifying the, the, you know, the Brooks membrane and the RP in two different uh, you know, layers you can actually better identify what is between and what is the deposition between one, one layer and the other. Mm -hmm. And I think it's uh, probably that will help us to, uh, you know, identifying earlier changes and, or, and uh, predict uh, a disease. And, and, you know, what we expect, particularly, for example, speaking about uh, geographic atrophy, we are always hoping to start, you know, a treatment before atrophy will come. Yeah. And so this is why the CAM was trying to, you know, identifying biomarkers and the OCT is probably the best uh, way to identify. Yeah. And of course, if we actually get uh, much more details as uh, we can do with a uh, high resolution, mm -hmm. will be uh, very useful. Yeah. Bas. May, Bas. May I th thank you, Steph. Let me ask a question while we're waiting for the audience. Uh, so Giovanni, Great presentation, as, as always. Uh, you know, both you and I were at, we, we were at the PCV course yesterday. We spoke at the yes. PCV course. I'm wondering, have you specifically looked at PCV? And I'm, you know, obviously we have some OCT criteria now. And I'm wondering whether you've observed that you can detect the sub RPE ring like lesion. Those things are very useful for identifying PCV, especially since OCTA can miss these lesions. Exactly. Um, and, you know, obviously ICG is best. Nobody will argue with that. But, have but it's more invasive. So. Yeah, but, 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 you know, yeah. So, so yeah, I, 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 it's actually, um, we have some cases where we really didn't be able to identify, you know, uh, with the OCTA, of course, but uh, also was not clear with the, uh, also ICG because, uh, you know, there was a small uh, a bulge and not able to see. And uh, you were clearly differentiated from the detachment, you know, the presence of a round shape, uh, you know, lesion attached to the RP, and that I think it's, a, it's another advantage. I'm wondering if we can see them with some consistency. You know, you talked about how with the retinal vessels, you could study the wall and the configuration alike, whether you could actually look at the sub-RP ring-like lesions, maybe even predict which ones may be more likely to, to bleed or have bad outcomes because you can see the wall configuration. Yeah, we, we, I, we never tried. That could be a, a good idea. And, you know, because uh, I think uh, polyps are not bad, except they can actually bleed a lot. And when it's bleeding, it's a, it's a, a problem because, they, you know, the lesion then it became. So be able, as uh, Vas said, to be uh, able to un understand who, which are the uh, bulge that will uh, uh, bleeding would be probably very interesting. Maybe back to Steph, you presented in past presentations, I followed them during your retina, on a couple of biomarkers and features of early or precursors of, of geographic atrophy. Do you miss anything where you want more details, where you would say this would be the one, or for those we know at the moment, the existing OCT would be enough? Are there any expectations seeing this uh, quality? Or do you say we have to see, look into that first? Yeah, I think first of all, these pictures are phenomenal. So they give us new insights in a yeah, very easy to acquire. Um, for the normal neovascular AMD patients with inter or subretinal fluid treat or not to treat, I think this is not the application here. 
but you are raising a very sensible point. So these definitions of early at atrophy, they're so granular, they still go so much into detail. We are struggling with the current OCT devices to look at different bands, at different structures. And um, I'm, I'm very confident that this device gives us much better consistency of seeing early atrophic changes. Yeah. And I think WAS will address this later. Yeah, the, con about that actually. Yeah, the so, consistency, yeah, yeah that's, that's the main point. So very interesting. So Giovanni, thank you very much. And we are going to have, if you don't mind, the main course now. <laughs> <laughs> Heavy. <laughs> Enhanced assessment of atrophic aim deletions using high resolution OCT. Well, in this case, the appetizer and dessert may be the best uh, parts of the meal then. But uh, thank you, though. Uh, well, isn't that so always the case? <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. Well, many people say that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so thank you very much. Uh, it's it's great to be able to participate in the symposium. I have to say, and actually, I want to thank um, Heidelberg for bringing this device to us. I think it's actually a significant leap forward. I usually don't say that about uh, managing imaging tools, but in terms of insights and what we're learning, uh, this I think is going to be really transformative. So these are my disclosures. So, okay, so uh, Giovanni already addressed this, but I just want as a reminder, because remembering when we're talking about improving the resolution of OCT, with, by high resolution OCT, we, move, we mean improvements in axial resolution, not improvements in transverse resolution. So obviously a, OCT is a three-dimensional um, imaging uh, technology. Uh, and so the XY planes, we're not affecting the resolution. We're talking about improvements in, in axial resolution. Uh, and Giovanni, I think, has highlighted uh, importantly some of the benefits. And actually, quite frankly, there's enhanced visualization of everything. Uh, but the enhanced visualization relative to AMD, which is going to be the focus of my presentation, really res relates to the outer retinal bands and Brooks membrane. And then you might be surprised I said enhanced visualization of retinal capillaries. What does that have to do with, with AMD? And I'll try to explain that as well. So just as a comparison, again, uh, you know, this is a sort of conventional, very high quality OCT, what you can do with high res. And then I want to show sort of what maybe what you might consider to be the, the holy grail of, 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 of adaptive, uh, adaptive optics OCT in terms of improving both transverse, sorry about the spelling here, transverse and axial resolution. And then you can see you can actually start to get a sense of even the cell bodies of the photoreceptors. And now we start to go back and look at our high res OCT images and say, yeah, we see that little kind of bump there. And actually that probably corresponds to, to where the, the cell bodies end uh, in the foveola. So, so I think that's kind of, uh, kind of interesting actually. But again, we're on this quest, right? With OCT was a transformative tool in the first place because it took us one step closer to histology and I feel like now with high res we've taken a few additional steps uh, closer. Giovanni talk about, talked about the benefits in terms of vascular imaging, and he highlighted this uh, very uh, uh, particular shape that you can observe. Uh, and I want to, to highlight that when, you know, obviously retinal capillaries appear as small hyperreflective structures in the retina, but notice that, uh, that there's a very unique shape to them. And part of this relates to how the blood flows, uh, the vascular the, the sort of the, the the trajectory of the blood flow and the and the and the kind of the organization of that creates this kind of shape in part. There's it's a bit more compl complicated than that. But the bottom line for the purpose of our discussion today is that these capillaries have this kind of snowman or hourglass. I think Giovanni called it an eight shape kind of figure, and that actually, as I'll show you, can be very helpful to us in our assessment of patients. Now, I will say that high resolution OCT has also posed some challenges because uh, uh, we had spent a lot of time in a consensus effort. Uh, I think almost a decade ago now to try to define the names for these outer retinal bands. Uh, and we and, and, and if you go back to read that original paper, it said, of course, this classification will have to be updated as we have better technologies that will allow us to see more. And actually, that time is now, because now we have this tool, we have these additional uh, layers, and we know there's not enough cells there. So you know that you're imaging subcellular layers, right? Whether you're imaging the band of melanosomes or other organelles, that we don't know for sure, um, you know, uh, but we have some ideas based on experts like Christine Curcio. Uh, but uh, that's going to be something that's going to be a real interesting exercise that's that's a, a, it's, it's hopefully about to commence. Uh, and also, of course, we can sometimes see structures which um, uh, which uh, some people didn't really believe existed, like this middle limiting membrane. Although I was talking to Ralph Eagle recently, and he said, no, that definitely uh, it's it's there, it's real, uh, which is uh, basically essentially the synapses between the location of the synapses between the receptors and the bipolar cells, uh, and usually you don't uh, see that, but when you have the resolution of high-resolution OCT, that can actually become visible. 
All right, so how has this impacted actually your assessment of patients with AMD? Because sometimes, you know, these, the images, oh, wow. I mean, they, there's no question. They're un- amazingly beautiful and pretty. But actually, I want to say that they're really tangible benefits that's actually quite impactful. Uh, we've spent many years, as, 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 as Stefan um, and Giovanni, the, it, many have been interested and have studied this topic as well in looking at risk factors for progression to advanced uh, AMD uh, and uh, certainly uh, patients who have calcified uh, or calc- calcified nodules uh, in Drusen, uh, as well as these hyperreflective foci. Uh, they seem to be two, uh, at least important uh, of many, important biomarkers uh, for progression. Hyperreflective foci in particular, just about every study you can come up with, people have found that that they are a particular risk factor for progression to uh, to late AMD. And you can kind of look at this as an agonal sign that the RP cells are so um, distressed that they're leaving the, R- the monolayer to migrate into the retina, seeking uh, hopefully a better life in the retina, which probably was misguided. But in any event, uh, you know, that could be one reason. So uh, these hyperflective foci, of course, are identified by these bright objects uh, in the retina. And you can see many such examples in this uh, image. But as I highlighted earlier, uh, capillaries also can appear uh, bright. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, uh, you know, that's uh, one advantage with high-res OCT is because capillaries have this very Distinct, distinct kind of hourglass appearance, as I highlighted earlier. So this presents an opportunity for us to distinguish hyperreflective foci, especially because you know, some people have even gone to taking separating hyperreflective foci into HRF and then hyperreflective dots to indicate even smaller hyperreflective foci. I don't know if that distinction is clinically meaningful yet, but uh, certainly the point is that you can have very small hyperreflective lesions. And you can imagine how they may be confused if they're, if, if you, once you get to the level of the DCP, which these RP cells can migrate to, you can imagine they could be confused. So this is a, an example of a conventional OCT image, actually, because it's blown up, it looks kind of blurry, but it's actually a good quality image. And you can appreciate that there are a lot of bright dots here. With high res, you can, th- I think this really highlights the improvement in axial resolution. You can recognize the hourglass shape. It's not possible because the insufficient axial resolution here to make that distinction. And so we can discriminate capillaries from hyperreflective foci more reliably. All right, let me dive more deeply into atrophic lesions in particular, because Stefan alluded to this. Uh, and, and Stefan and Frank Holtz, they put on a fabulous course just earlier today on uh, looking at uh, on, 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 on talking about uh, uh, assessing atrophy on various different imaging modalities, including on OCT. Uh, and so, of course, we have this definition from the CAM group of complete RP not retinal atrophy, or CRORA which is defined by the presence of hypertransmission of a size that reading centers thought they could identify reliably uh, with evidence of over, uh, overlying RP attenuation or disruption of a similar size, uh, and, then, uh, and then some evidence of overlying photoreceptor generation largely manifests in, in, uh, in uh, deterioration of the outer retinal bands. So uh, and then uh, once you have that as your end stage sort of definition, you can say, well, what if what if you don't quite get there? You have these features, but they don't quite meet the size criteria. Or, for example, here you have hypertransmission, but it's kind of banded, this kind of barcode. It's kind of irregular. Even the RPE band here you can see is is, is clearly abnormal, but is not completely absent. Uh, you, that helped us define like one step before in this incomplete RP not a retinal atrophy aurora. And these kinds of determinations, I mean, why why are we interested in precursor lesions? We're interested in precursor lesions because we all believe that that if we're going to treat atrophy, we probably need to intervene earlier. It's great that we have, at least in the U.S. so far, two FDA-cleared treatments, but, you know, it's it's, it's still ultimately a modest benefit. And the the hope is that if you treat earlier, you could get a larger benefit. So how can you study that? You need to have precursor lesions. So this is just an analysis that was published with another similar analysis from Avicen Capta that's in, in uh, press now. But, uh, but the same concept of looking at uh, maybe ret- slowing the conversion from Irora to CRR as evidence of progression. That's all good, but, uh, but in this uh, nice um, uh, paper that, uh, that uh, from, from Cam that Stefan had uh, led, we looked to see, well, well, how good are reading centers at actually doing this determination? And we found that certainly for Irora, it's not easy. Uh, and in fact, if you look at this, there's a lot of numbers in this table, but you can look in particular uh, that, uh, that the agreement rate uh, and, uh, and the agreement coefficient, especially for judging the RPE disruption, was pretty challenging. 
right? So it's very difficult uh, to do this. And so we were hopeful, as, as Stefan alluded to, that high-res OCT could help with that. And uh, and, and I have to say that, uh, that I, I've been very impressed with, uh, uh, as Giovanni said, it's very difficult to quantify the thickness of Brooks membrane because it's a very thin structure. Uh, and I think high-res OCT has really helped us appreciate that, that you know, we were overestimating or over, we, we had a, the Brooks membrane is much thinner than we thought, right? So you can see that in this comparison. You can see how beautifully Brick's membrane is rendered, right, with high-res OCT. You can see its thinness. People often talk about thickness. I'll talk about its thinness. The thinness of Brick's membrane, I think, is really accentuated. And you can really appreciate the thinness of the Cori capillaris as well. Just that little dark band just below Brick's membrane is really the full extent of the Cori capillaris uh, in this image. Also, you can start to see other features that we use to, to judge the, the border of atrophy. You can see the ELM descent. You can also see that, that you know, because you can really appreciate the separation between Brooks membrane and the RP cells, you can see this, Christine Kersey has described all these different phenotypes of RP cells at the border of these atrophic lesions. This one looks like it's kind of balled up um, and is probably one of these agonal RP cells. But my point is it's much easier, I think you can appreciate readily, to distinguish the RPE termination uh, when you have this kind of rendering of Brooks membrane. So uh, there's just more uh, comparisons again. Uh, you know, we've really been quite enamored with the uh, with the improved visualization of Brooks membrane. Um, and there's actually a lot of interest. There's obviously there's companies looking at targeting, um, you know, Brooks membrane therapeutics for things like for conditions like pseudoxanthum elasticum associated with android streak. So there's an increased premium now on being able to study uh, Brooks membrane. Also, uh, we, we were pleasantly, uh, I won't say surprised, but impressed by the fact that features like hypertransmission seem to be more clearly visible, as well as obviously the outer retinal bands uh, using, uh, using high-res OCT. And again, this is a direct comparison using the same level of averaging. All right, so again, that's all great. I've shown you some nice images and I said, oh, this looks like it should do a better job. Uh, but I think you ultimately have to translate, uh, excuse me, you have to uh, study this systematically uh, in order to uh, to be confident. And so this was a study that we recently completed that's in in, in press now uh, that uh, looked at um, subjects uh, who were imaged uh, with AMD, imaged with both the, spec the, spec the standard spectralis as well as the high-risk OCT on the same day. You can see the imaging protocol there. Uh, and basically, we've adapted a model uh, somewhat similar to what Stefan had published in CAM Report 6. Uh, and so we started initially with two um, experts, um, senior experts, who looked at the, the volumes for the presence of c aurora or absolute absence of atrophy. It'll explain that in further detail because uh, we really wanted a control sort of region. And they identified one region of interest uh, in each eye. So, so each eye will only picked one, even though there could be other regions in that eye, we picked only one. And they selected a B scan passing right through the center of the lesion as well as scans above and below. And so this curated set was then provided to a new grading team. And so, so they basically this is, just, this is just cropped to show just the lesion itself, but the raters that I'll explain in a second, they got the full They've got they they got the uh, the, the 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 full B scans, but in any event, uh, the cases were all mixed up, so you had no idea what was what. And then we had five masked independent readers who were really new to the process. This was a training process that was uh, applied to them. So, because we wanted to see if this would adapt to somebody who's a relative novice who may not be experienced in this kind of assessment. Uh, and so I'm not gonna go through the de detail of the grading manual that was constructed uh, for them, but we did, they, they were graded several things. They did a qualitative assessment uh, looking uh, for just determining, is there zero, is the lesion that the expert has selected for you. Is there no atrophy? Is there C. or Irora present there? Uh, and then they actually asked them to grade for the presence of specific features that are relevant to the definition of C. Aurora. And we also got quantitative. We said, can you grade the extent of the subsidence or the thinning uh, or the wedge or the um, hypertransmission width or the, the width of various other defects in the outer retinal band? So we looked at both qualitative and quantitative assessments. Uh, and this is, uh, again, we adapted things from previous uh, publications in terms of assessing integrator agreement. We also looked at some inter-device agreement, but I'm really focused more on the integrator agreement for the purposes of this um, presentation. Uh, and so these are some of the results. And I'm going to show some busy tables. I'm going to apologize in advance, but I'll highlight the important things. So again, 
we select, we pre-curated, selected the data uh, before the graders could see that to have like essentially a third of, of each of these categories. So if you, if you, so just looking at these percentages, if they classified things perfectly, you'd expect all these to be 33%. But just the, I guess the important uh, thing to realize is that there was a better agreement with high-res OCT compared to standard OCT amongst the graders for this classification. It's already apparent when you look at the percentages anyways. Uh, and so this is just some examples of, of you know, scenarios that you can imagine uh, where, where, again, there was consensus amongst all readers for this particular uh, case, whereas the graders were kind of puzzled here. This is another case where, again, uh, it was an unexpected benefit in terms of the ability to better visualize the hypertransmission. I think you can, it's pretty apparent here. You can see every, all the readers agreed in this case, but were kind of confused about the, they were, they were unsure about the dimension. That was the problem in this case because they weren't sure about how to measure the borders of that. Uh, this is the bit, one of the busy tables. I said, please don't read this, but I will uh, highlight that these are uh, a variety of the different uh, features that were studied. I do want to highlight that uh, the outer retinal bands probably showed the highest improvement or the largest improvement uh, with uh, high-res um, OCT. Uh, the quantitative features were really striking in terms of the real benefits. And again, many of us who are in reading centers are interested in quantifying these lesions for future clinical trials. This is obviously of great interest to us. Uh, and we did see dramatically better uh, agreement. You can see this was moderate reliability uh, for these uh, measurement of these features uh, using standard resolution OCT, but uh, was much better with high-res OCT in this analysis. So to summarize, uh, you know, I've shown you how high-resolution OCT improves visualization of both the outer as well as some inner retinal macular features which are relevant to assessing AMD. I think that we have good evidence now that it improves our ability to reliably classify and quantify the features uh, for these atrophic lesions. And so I think now we're going to be all charged with uh, looking at our patients with atrophy. And I, I do feel that this is of considerable value in this new era of therapeutics for atrophic AMD. I want to acknowledge um, the team members who worked on this project in, in particular, Alireza Mahmoudi, who spearheaded this in our lab. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, again, my view goes into the audience for potential questions while I'm waiting for them. Um, I wonder, I mean, I enjoyed the main as much as the starter, personally, <laughs> I have to say. Um, and I found it interesting when you compared the graders with the higher resolution and the lower resolution. However, I was wondering, is somehow time an issue as well? Do they, does it take longer? Is that taken into account? Because, you know, if it's more detailed, maybe you get quicker to that. Or if you look very long enough on the less good scan, is that something taken into account or should be taken into account? Um, Stefan, as always, you ask great questions. Uh, I wish we had consulted with you before we did the study. We didn't. Uh, we didn't think about that, um, and uh, and it is potentially a confounder, right? Uh, so I don't actually know. Uh, I'm actually now now that you asked that question, I'm thinking when I look at my high res OCT scans, does it take me more or less time to interpret them? Because there's probably some enamored part where you're like, oh, it's such a beautiful image, and you spend yeah. more time looking at it. Um, I would like to think that it's faster because you don't you have fewer questions, right? Mm -hmm. So, but I don't know that. I mean, we didn't or study. Or lost in the beauty of the image. Yes, much yes. The images, are, as you guys are seeing, the <laughs> images are really beautiful. Uh, but, um, but I, I think there is real practical value to it. But that's a great question, uh, and it's uh, and I don't and we didn't control for that. I didn't even because, think of, honestly. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, because so. time matters. Obviously, looking at all the discussions before. Any other thoughts on, on, on this presentation, on the main course, from the antipasti perspective, or um, um, do you, what, what, what is the next step, Giovanni, for, for high resolution, in your opinion, or in your lab? Well, I, I think it's uh, open to many other things. I, I just uh, started, you know, with, uh, to show a little bit on, on the uh, vessels. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, my colleagues uh, are working a lot on, on that, uh, and, uh, and, and probably we will be able to differentiate uh, uh, some diseases just looking at uh, the wall uh, of the vessels. Uh, you can actually probably see also the speed and measure the speed. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's really a, a very easy instrument to use but it can give very interesting information. And, and to that, I was going to add one comment that Giovanni reminded me of something that I think is very important is that, you know, we, 
we all love OCT angiography. It's very sensitive for detecting neovascularization, but I believe that there are cases of early neovascularization that we don't see in OCT angiography yet, but you can see the communication between the chorea capillaris through Brooks membrane into the, into the very well-defined sub-RPE or the, the, the lesion that the, the Giovanni and I described, the double layer side. And so I think that's going to be an interesting area of study. Well, I think forward. also that uh, uh, you can really uh, do a map of real anatomy because you remember the OCTA is, uh, you see if it's perfused or not the vessel. So you don't see, you, you identifying the lumen, but not the vessel. And with the OCT, probably you can be able to do uh, the same map but uh, but using a different way. So I think it's, uh, there is a lot of possibility. Yeah. And the other interesting thing I will show this afternoon uh, in another presentation on, with, uh, on mainly on the vessels. And uh, it's nice to see that uh, as the Brooks membrane, it's smaller the layer that you can measure than not what you actually measure with uh, the standard OCT. Right. Uh, I think this is interesting, and I was as well appealed by the discussion about hyperreflective foci in vessels because I think there was a big mix, mix, mix of interpretation of these structures, and with higher resolution you can differentiate as well. And uh, well, you mentioned, and maybe I don't know who can comment on that. You mentioned I, I don't know if I get it right or wrong that there is more potential in measuring the perfusion. And wh when this is going to come? What do what is needed? Because I get so many questions we, in that we direction. Have to ask, you have to ask uh, to Tillman and, yeah. and, uh, and the yeah. engineers. <laughs> yeah. But I think uh, you know there is a possibility. Uh, right. I, I hope it will be done uh, yeah. 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 soon. Yeah. Stefan, any more thoughts on, on 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 the main course before we we come to the to the Dolce? My belly is full now, and yeah. I need a nap. <laughs> I think it was still light enough to enjoy a proper dolce, and I thank Vas for this great presentation. I would like to serve the last course. Stefan, please come to the stage. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Stefan, for the introduction and the invitation to speak here. So um, I would like to focus more on fine detailed imaging with um, the high resolution OCT. So we have already heard that we can detect uh, very nicely early features of atrophy in a much more detailed way, but we can even also visualize uh, very smaller changes and a very good example in this context are reticular drusen or reticular pseudodrusen or even also called subretinal drusenoid deposits, SDDs. And as we all know, these lesions represent a high risk marker for macular degeneration, for post manifestation and progression. They are highly prevalent, more prevalent in later stages as compared to earlier stages. Um, they are a predictor for development of late um, AMD, in addition to hyperreflective uh, hyper foci. You may have seen this also on one of our slides. Um, showing the risk factor of progression with particular pseudodrusen. And then we also know, based on the data from the LEAD study, that um, there's a poorer outcome with a nanosecond laser intervention in the presence of particular pseudodrusen. To a short introduction um, and to warm up here on reticular pseudodrusen, they have been first described in the 1990s by the French group around Mimoun, Subran, and Koskas as an ill-defined network of oval to roundish irregularities with a variable diameter of approximately 100 microns. And later it has been shown that they're particularly well visible with the enfast confocal scan laser ophthalmoscope and best with a combination of IR and uh, fundus autofluorescence um, imaging. And they're also visible by other modalities, uh, invasive fluorescein angiography and ICG. And we also know that in terms of topography that they're most prevalent in the superior macula, but they can also cure even nasal to the disc. And there's all similar to geographic atrophy. We also know that there can be, or very quite common, there's a phenomenon of foveal sparing, meaning that the initial manifestation is in many cases superior to the fovea and this then um, circling around the fovea uh, and then later in the course the fovea is also involved. 
When the um, current standard OCT was um, introduced in the mid 2000s, we were able to actually, at that time we already called it high resolution OCT imaging, which is not really true anymore today with a new device. But at that time we were able to look at the border zone of atrophy and early atrophic features and also were able to describe that reticular pseudodrusin amazingly correlate to depositions above the RPE. So against the notion that all our all MD changes initially are below the RPE. And this has been um, yeah, further investigated um, in ongoing studies with a point-to-point -point correlation of this dot um, like lesions and um, with a halo and um, in, in particular in the relation to the um, atrophic border and different stages have been described this uh, slide in the middle um, by the group um, from Sandrine Zweifel and Rick Spade showing you the possible evolution of lesions. So we have first deposition of material above the RPE and uh, below the um, um, EZ and then we have like this cone-shaped elevation once more material builds up and finally in stage three there's a disruption of um, the outer retinal layers with these cone-like um, structures and um, this can be also measured um, to give you an idea the, um, the, uh, the, the height of these lesions is around 70 to um, 80 microns. So with high resolution OCT we now have the ability to have an increased axial op optical resolution. So the lateral resolution, as pointed out by Vaz, um, remains unchanged. And um, in terms of numbers, so we go down from seven to three um, optical resolution. So as clinicians, um, we, I think, or I strongly believe, we always have to be very careful with these numbers because they're purely optical. The question or more relevant for us is the anatomical resolution. Can we actually see better? And um, as you know, media opacities and other things need to be taken into consideration, particularly in our um, elderly patients with macular degeneration. Um, and this is again showing the difference between the spectralis with, with a 100 art, so very dense, uh, very um, extensive averaging of scans um, compared to the high resolution OCT. And the pure better visualization of the retinal bands and layers also increases the annotation of layers and the measurement of thickness of different um, retinal bands and layers and also allow, uh, allows us to get better slabs of different uh, layers. And this has been shown here by Leon von der Emde and other people from Bonn uh, when two medical uh, graders segmented uh, the retinal layers. Um, there was a higher reliability with a high resolution with the um, conventional spectralis um, device. And here I would like to focus with you on the outer retina again. So these are not just the known layers as we have been used um, since the um, landmark work by Giovanni and the OCT um, International Classification Group. So um, specifically in AMD, um, we see the separation of the RPE and Brooks membrane, which might be important as, as shown here. And um, then we have the external limiting membrane and the ellipsoid zone. But there seems to be that in some cases, at least, we can actually distinguish different layers between the ellipsoid zone and the retinal pigment epithelium. And the hypothesis is that we see here cone outer segment tips and rod outer um, segment, uh, segment tips. And um, I, I will share with you uh, even more pictures comparing um, the spectralis and the high resolution OCT. And um, yeah, actually, you have to really zoom in to see the differences. So we see uh, here again the separation of the RPE and Brooks membrane, and we all have a better uh, visualization of the um, external limiting membrane. So we can actually see how, how the, the descent of the ELM inside the lesion and here is coming out again. In terms of your question, Stefan, regarding the time of viewing these pictures, it is more time consuming because we have to magnify the pictures and, and look at, the, at these fine detailed structures. So it's not a usual OCT scan you stroll through within seconds using your mouse in a, in a clinical setting. You really need to, need to, and you probably will not see a big difference if you have a small monitor and compare high resolution to an all spectralis OCT, you may not see a big difference. You really have to magnify or use a, a high resolution monitor to see um, the differences. 
Yeah. So this is an, a patient with confluent, um, confluent uh, large drusen, and here again we, we can see, um, yeah, the tragic beauty of these changes with very, very well visualization of the external ellipticity membrane, the ellipsoid zone, and um, obviously um, the drusen. And this is showing you again that we really need to look at the resolution. So this is a um, normal spec stars device. And let me show you now um, the um, high resolution OCT. You can uh, um, re really appreciate that there's much more detail um, in these pictures um, um, that we have not been able to see um, before. We already talked about basal laminar deposits. You, um, maybe so far you have thought that this is more something uh, histological people are interested in, um, but it is the risk factor of early AMD. So if we know from histology for a long time that basal laminar deposits are more or less the first sign of age-related macular degeneration. And when you cannot separate RPE and Brooks membrane, you cannot see this. But now we can separate these layers. So um, we can actually look deeper into the clinical manifestation, not at a cross-sectional uh, view only, but also over time, and study um, if they are, um, yeah, if how, how fast these um, changes um, um, occur over time. So these are some other examples um, of randomly selected patients we have acquired um, at our institution. And again, it's very easy to acquire the images. It's, this, it's the same time of acquisition as you are used with your normal OCT device. So there's no big magic for the clinician in it other than the pictures are looking um, much better and there's no training or so required for your um, technician to acquire these images. The biggest issue is actually to, to, um, to be sure that you use a, a, a good protocol to acquire meaningful images here as with the standard um, OCT. Uh, here's some other examples with basal lamina um, deposits and you can actually see that the RPE is severely compromised. So, um, and there's not a homogeneous um, RPE reflective band anymore in this situation in a patient with um, geographic atrophy. This is another patient with geographic atrophy. We can look at both sides of the lesion um, see here and see here the red shaped band Again, the descent of the external limiting membrane, the basal laminar deposits, they go over in drusen here. There's another drus here, and then we see here the uh, delineated um, RPE and the choroidal hypertransmission at the edge of atrophy. So in terms of reticular pseudodrusen, this is a high-dense OCT scan. We can actually much, uh, much better look into, the, uh, into these changes. In this case, we have a typical like, C-shaped manifestation of reticular pseudodrusen as highlighted here on the left with um, four-wheel sparing. Um, and um, uh, we can clearly see that there is deposition of material um, above the RPE with um, uh, these cone-like structures and even in some lesions there, we have disruption um, over time. Um, this is some other example with a localized area of reticular pseudodrusen, so we can uh, quite clearly see where they start and where um, they end um, over time. This is another, um, you can actually see how big the resolution is here with the normal IR image. It's quite blurry, um, while the um, high resolution OCT gives us a, yeah, a clear picture with um, disruption here through the uh, ELM and EZ and uh, just touching uh, the sports layers here. Again, individual lesions showing you on the um, high resolution um, OCT. So what we also did is, um, I mentioned this earlier, to look at different, um, different slabs. Um, so actually to really confirm that reticular pseudodrusen are above the RPE located, there's still, I think, an ongoing debate, sometimes very personal, if reticular pseudodrusen are not even, uh, maybe sometimes are in the choroid, um, uh, which um, I think the high risk OCT gives us even more confidence that this is really matured above the RPE. So here on the lower right, we have the um, SLO infrared image. It's the brightest in Congress has been adapted. That's why it looks a little bit more um, black and um, um, more in contrast. And this is the Enfast slab um, when we segment it actually um, on top of the um, um, EZ and um, at Brooks membrane. And then if you compare the Enfast slab to the IR um, CSLO, it's, um, yeah, it's basically, it looks very much um, similar, confirming that these depositions are really located um, above the um, RPE. 
This is another case with extensive and rather quite large reticular pseudodrusen, um, um, very similar in both eyes. And, and here again, um, we, we can see um, the changes by the high, re high resolution OCT um, in the right eye. There's actually also a lesion in the very center um, at, at the fovea in, in this patient. And in the left eye, there's a similar um, appearance. So in summary, high resolution OCT imaging um, yeah, clearly pr uh, provides an improved visualization of the outer retina, the retina, retina of the main epithelium beyond many other structures as we have learned today. And in terms of reticular pseudodrusen, this allows us an early detection and to better look into the degree of the manifestation. Potentially it will allow us to monitor the, to better these changes over time and also and when we look even further, um, and uh, it might be a, a very um, detailed tool to look for potential response to emergent therapeutic interventions. Thank you very much. Oh. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Stefan, for rounding up uh, that excellent meal uh, with, the, uh, with the reticular pseudodrusen. Are there any questions? Are there comments from, from the panel here to to, to mention, uh, to, to comment. Um, let, let's summarize maybe the, the, these three talks in whatever manner. I mean, we learned, you mentioned the basal uh, deposits being one of the important things to detect, uh, the uh, basal membrane deposits for, for early GA. We, we saw, we, we want to see what's between the uh, Brooks membrane, etc. So, where is this, um, as a, a summary conclusion from everyone's perspective, again going? I mean, I thank everyone for being here without uh, that we even did not mention PECA Zetoplan and we did not mention artificial intelligence. However, um, uh, artificial <laughs> intelligence probably requires that amount of details and and Stefan, you look on artificial intelligence a lot. Is there anything you're missing uh, for, for, for the training of artificial intelligence you might find in a high resolution? So every application of artificial intelligence is only as good as it has been trained. Yeah? And even if there's a big claim of nice tools to detect different things, you have to be careful because um, these algorithms may, their performance may be weak in certain situations. And one reason also may, might be because the images don't give enough detail. So a typical example, interretinal fluid and outer retinal tubulations. We as clinicians may struggle to distinguish them. I'm not sure if every algorithm out there can distinguish these lesions. And if we have a high resolution OCT, um, the AI is probably much better in detecting these changes. Any thoughts to my right or are we all, all set for now? Bas, your closing yeah. remarks for the two days. <laughs> well, no, th 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 thanks again for organizing this. I think that we're all fortunate. We are in this great era, a golden era of retinal imaging, and uh, we have these kinds of advances. Uh, the fact that we can understand the disease, the, the, the insights we're getting into the disease is incredible, right? And, it, and actually, it's very necessary. It's exciting to see the technology, the resolution keeping up with the fact that we're in an era uh, very targeted molecular and cellular therapeutics. We need technologies that offer this kind of resolution. And, and maybe one question to Giovanni to, to, to close the whole... I mean, you started with what, what do we miss? And you have been from scratch <coughs> exposed to all kinds of resolutions. Yeah? And you always have been excited about the existing resolution. Can you... I mean, most of... Oh, well, actually, all the people don't have that high resolution probably available. I think it's already huge what they can you can do with the everyday OCT. Uh, so I would say it's not that you need it now, but what what do you think uh, uh, is should we tell yeah, the well, audience as take home message? I then? think it's uh, if we think about the first OCT, the Stratus, and uh, you know the first uh, um, you know <coughs> message was. Uh, we can actually see histology live. And, uh, and of course, was not exactly what we wanted to see with histology. But I think more and more we are close to histology and that will be really a big advantage of such a, an imaging modalities. Of course, for a real life right now, I think uh, what we already have 
it's more than the stratus, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, as usual, we want more and more. So that I think it's already a step forward. Okay, thank you very much. If you want more, we served a full course meal. Go to the booth and have a digestive there. We might uh, serve that right there. Thank you for coming. <laughs>